of Alex. It's my pleasure to uh, welcome Alexi Matter from the uh, Observatoire de la Côte d'Azur, where Alex is working uh, on basically everything related to Matisse, uh, the science uh, commissioning, data analysis. Um, Alex is also the coordinator of the French VLTI Expertise Center Network, so including Nice, uh, Grenoble, Lyon, and Paris. Before that, Alexis, well, you have done a postdoctoral research stay both in Grenoble and in Bonn, where you were working mostly on the young stellar object uh, studies. And you obtained your PhD thesis in 2010, I think, from the NIST Observatory on the characterization of asteroids with uh, VLTI. I hope I have everything. Uh, yeah, correct. among others. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so thank you for uh, being with us uh, this afternoon. And uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your presentation and good afternoon to uh, everyone. So it's a pity I could not come to uh, to uh, Leuven, but uh, due to uh, personal commitments, I could not. <laughs> so uh, I, I try to uh, present uh, today uh, uh, actually an overview on uh, Matisse, uh, what it can do, what it already uh, did, and to uh, advertise uh, what what uh, would be possible with uh, such an instrument, such a new instrument. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Okay, that should be okay, right? It's okay for the slides? Yes, that's, that's okay. Fine. Okay, so today, as I told you, I'm going to present you an overview about the MATIS, which is the mid infrared VHI instrument, uh, so complementary to, to gravity. So, why MATIS? Because uh, it comes from the, the name of a of famous French painter, Henri Matisse. So for sure, I won't <laughs> present, uh, will make a presentation on uh, life works that is influence of uh, Henri Matisse, but just to show you that there, there might be some connection between science and art sometimes. So my presentation will be on Matisse the instrument which was born, uh, let's say, in 2019, uh, officially for the astronomical community, and which is expected to live as long as possible. So just uh, as, as introduction, I would like to remind you the instrumental context, the current instrumental context, I mean, current and also over the last 10, uh, 10 years in terms of wavelength coverage and resolution. And actually, what we can see is that Matisse covers actually a unique uh, slot or unique window in terms of um, uh, spectral domain and resolution, because it's uh, more or less the only instrument that can go up to now to uh, the milliard second scale in terms of angular resolution in the mini infrared domain, which is super complementary to what we have in the infrared and in the visible from Shara array and uh, gravity now, or uh, in the millimeter with ALMA, or also uh, in uh, the infrared domain that would be covered by the JWST instruments. <clears throat> so I wanted to highlight this complementarity uh, of Matisse with respect to the, the current uh, scene of uh, instruments. OK, so most of you know the VTI, but I wanted to uh, give again an overview on that uh, awesome uh, observatory, because it's really, uh, when you put a step back when it, and you think about what uh, could be designed and done and now is working routinely, it's really amazing. <laughs> so the VLT, VLTI, uh, I should say, is composed of four editor telescopes. And uh, oh, there's a, OK, there was a, OK, no. Never mind. Uh, and uh, four uh, movable 80, um, 1.8 meter telescopes, auxiliary telescopes, which can be used uh, in interferometric mode to observe a same source and combine their light to produce 
interferences and get information about the object. I will uh, detail that aspect uh, a bit more. And it's in the focal lab that we have different our interferometric instruments, which are, I would say, a common retina to several apertures. So we have, uh, of course, the, the, two the three instruments, Pioneer observing in H-band, Gravity observing in K-band, and uh, Matisse observing in uh, two uh, wavelength domains in LM band, I would say, from 3 to uh, 5 micron, and N band from 8 to 13 micron. So you have just a schematic of the different parts of Matisse, which are composed basically of a warm optic table, which actually uh, collects the four um, beams from the four telescopes, and two cryostats where we have the detectors. And why two cryostats? Because uh, up to now, we don't have infrared detectors that can cover such a wide uh, spectral, um, um, I would say, bandwidth from 3 to 13 microns. So we had to separate the two uh, detectors into independent cryostats. And of course, since we are observing in the, in the mean infrared, the thermal infrared, we need a very cold environment to make things dark. <laughs> around the detectors because otherwise everything is uh, is uh, glowing in that uh, in that wavelength domain okay so that's the the part um, representing matisse so matisse instrument here you have a view cat's eye view of matisse where we see the warm optic table which is a very complicated thing with lots of optomechanical modules and the two cryostats which are actually uh, getting the light uh, from the four uh, beams. And it's in, in the cryostat that we combine the, the beams, and just to be, to be clear. Matisse uh, was built by four institutes, uh, with um, actually uh, Nice being the PI Institute. Uh, it's more than 100 colleagues who worked on that uh, during more than, over more than 10 years. Uh, and the instrument cost approximately 15 uh, million euros. So it gives you a kind of scale uh, for such um, ISO instrument. And uh, okay, ma many, uh, many photos. And uh, of course, you have uh, Bruno Lopez, who is the PI of uh, Matisse. And the time scale that you count can consider for such instrument is more than 10 years from the kickoff meeting, which was in November 2006, to February 2018, which was the first light, not even the, the opening of Matisse to the community, but just the first light, where you have for the first time photons getting to the to detectors. Matisse is uh, open to community, uh, has been open to community uh, since 2019, but still we are um, testing and really fine tuning a few, few uh, aspects of Matisse. Uh, and it will be soon delivered officially to ISO uh, in 2000, end of 2022, normally. Okay, so what is Matisse? It's the newest instrument of the VLTI, as I said before which can combine four telescopes of eight, eight meter or 1.8 meter. One can choose, of course. It observes, as I said, in thermal infrared from three to five mi mi uh, micron, oh, there is a typo here, from three to five micron and not millimeter, and eight to 13 micron. And the, the big advantage is that it's the only instrument that can actually access the mini r second scale resolution in those wavelength domains, which are especially very interesting for uh, several driving science cases that I will describe a, a bit after. Knowing not only that you have access to uh, various spectral signatures in those wavelength domains on the gas molecules and the, the dust. So as a teaser, this talk contains now eight new images in the mean infrared at milliard second scale angular resolution. So uh, that's uh, nice that now, uh, since the instrument is now working and operating, it's being operating routinely, uh, I can show reconstructed images because Matisse was built as an imager um, first. So that's uh, an important uh, thing to, to, to keep in mind and to promote, promote it. 
Okay, since um, Matisse co okay, covers two uh, spectral bands, it has also spectroscopic capabilities. And, and you see the different spectral resolution that we can uh, actually um, access with instruments in LM band and in N band, covering, so I won't detail everything, but it covers different, uh, very interesting. Um, uh, gas or solid state features. So on the gas molecules, big molecules, ices, and also, uh, of course, um, dust, uh, which can, of course, allow uh, very interesting uh, science on the, the objects I will uh, talk about a bit later. So that's uh, a view of Matisse. I won't detail uh, that. So don't be afraid. Just to um, mention that we have many opto optomechanical modules along the, the optical train of the four uh, beams, because you have to keep in mind that for an interferometer, actually, the, the, uh, I would say the signal processing starts way before the uh, photons get to the detector, because we, are, we, we need to perform several operations to prepare the beams for their combination. So that, that's very, uh, that's a super important aspect to keep in mind uh, for interferometers. That's how you have the, the these uh, many uh, modules. And to be a bit more, uh, I would say concrete and friendly, user-friendly, I'm gonna show you a 3D animation we made, uh, I think three years ago on what we could expect from uh, four beams arriving at the level of Matisse. So arriving from the telescopes down to the focal lab where we have Matisse. So here you have a view uh, of the warm optic table, which is basically um, uh, composed of two symmetric parts, one for the, the injection of the LM band beams into the LM band crustat, and one for the N band beams to be injected into the and then close that. So you will see, oh, I'm going to play it. OK, so you see the four beams arriving. And of course, we're going to follow just one beam for sake of clarity. So there is first here, which is very important, different modules to align transversely the, the beam so that they are they're propagating properly inside the, the the, the different um, uh, parts of the monotic table. Of course, you have a very important function, which is the spectral separation, which happens at that moment. Then you have something that you may have heard before about interferometers, delay lines, because we have internal delay lines uh, for Matisse to actually control and fine tune any, I would say, static path difference between the, the, the four beams in each spectral domain, because to remind you um, what we need to make the interferences possible, actually we need the beams to travel, to have traveled the same path from the source down to the recombination point. They must have traveled the same uh, or the almost the same path to allow interferences to happen, to occur. That's why you have these, uh, these uh, um, devices, these delay lines, to really control the path difference between the, the, the beams. And then you have the injection into the cryostats, where we see, we will see that at the entrance of the cryostat, you have actually a series of masks and special filters to really get only the interesting part of the beams to get rid of most of the thermal background emission from the from the walls, from uh, the optics, etc., to really um, get the central part of it. So see that it's being unbuilt to see all the details. Of course, in the cryostats, stats, we have uh, also many uh, opto uh, optical modules, not optomechanical, to filter them to actually reconfigure the position of the individual beams to position them in the proper way before they are combined. Then you have, here you have a filter, which allows to really select the proper spectral coverage we want. And then at the very end, 
we have here we have the spectral uh, dispersers and the lens which will be used to recombine the four beams down to that point. So all that to end up to something that is uh, super small. So you get the fringes there at the very end of the, of the optical train. Okay, so now I go back to, I hope it was uh, useful to un understand a bit uh, what the, the, the observation procedure consisted in. Okay, so I'm gonna share, oh, sorry, I'm sharing again the slides. Sorry, Thanks. this slide is a bit heavy because the picture is quite heavy. Okay, up. Sorry. Okay. I don't know why, but the slides are passing. Okay. Great. So that's the a typical signal we have on, for instance, on the element detector. So I told you that Matisse is a spectral interferometer. So it means that it forms fringes that are dispersed. And on the detector, what you see is that you have the spatial direction. We have the fringes. Of course, here you have six fringe patterns because we combine four beams. And you have six ways to combine uh, beams pairwise. That's why it's a bit messy, but you have six fringe patterns there. And in LM band, what we have, we have the possibility to, okay, to get, to take a two third of the light to form the interferences and one third to form the four spectra to measure the photometry. Because it's also important in interferometry to measure the photometry. While in the interferometry channel, we measure the, what we call the coherent flux, which is the flux coming from the spatially unresolved regions of your object that will form the, the, the interferences, that will form the fringes. That's the energy we have in the fringes. So that's a typical signal we can get uh, from Matisse. Okay, so Matisse, the first slide. So uh, I, I would like to show you one, uh, actually one video of the first slide and show you how it, <laughs> how it is when we have a first light on an interferometric instrument at the VLTI. So it was, in two, it was back in 2018. And what you can see here basically is that here you have fringes, but only two. You have just, uh, no, sorry, uh, yeah, two, two fringe systems. What we need actually to get six fringes. And what you see in that presentation is actually a 2D fluid transform of the interferograms. But we have that bright spot, which is the, the, the energy. So that's the total energy we have. So it means that we have photons. And then we have uh, here two bright spots, which are representing the, the, the fringe energy. So it means that we have, and that we got two fringe systems, but we need actually to get six to really say, okay, we, Matisse is working. And it's symmetric with respect to that first spot. So the idea is you move the VLTI delay lines, so those systems that can control the path difference between the beams to get the six things. So you see, we are expecting six, but still only two are appearing, that one and that one. And you see the, this presentation, this energy. So it's searching, searching, searching. So the, it's, um, it's not uh, sure will uh, work. So you see that the, actually the, 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 those two spots are moving uh, up and down because we are searching for the right position. And at some point, then boom, okay, we got the, the four remaining fringes. Of course, uh, people were cheering. It's not the, the same scale as when you, <laughs> you watch, for instance, uh, uh, the, uh, the landing of a, of a space probe on Mars, or the rover, or rover on, on Mars, uh, with uh, um, camera shooting that uh, that event at NASA quarters, for instance. But okay, it's it's kind of similar. I just wanted to show you what uh, 
concretely what we have as when we say, okay, that was the first light or we need for the instruments. That's exactly that. You get the fringes, uh, the, all the fringes you are expected to, uh, to, to have. So you see, uh, okay, that's the end of the, of the movie. Okay, let's go back to the presentation. So the first the data were uh, taken, of course, on a <laughs> pretty, I would say, easy target, bright target, beta juice, where you see the nice fringes from L-Ben, M-Ben, and N-Ben, so the all, uh, the whole uh, spectral coverage, with uh, uh, the interferometric observables that were taken, that were excellent, and actually that were used for uh, a paper to be uh, published uh, soon. By the way, uh, I make some advertisement for the, the tools uh, from the JMMC, which you may uh, know from the OFIT Explorer, which is very handy to display uh, interferometric observables in just uh, one, uh, one shot. But overall, uh, over the, the two, three years after that first slide, we, uh, we've done, uh, carried out uh, different commissioning runs to test Matisse on sky. And I can tell you Matisse works <laughs> three years after it has been uh, made uh, available to the community. Uh, no, but actually it was made available knowing that it worked. But now we are really all fine tuning and optimizing the performance estimates and this kind of thing. Here you have a typical Elben transform function, which is the, the evolution of the visibility, the fringe contrast that you get on uh, calibrators. And so uh, stars for which you know exactly what you should get in terms of visibility. We uh, estimate the performances of Matisse, so I won't detail those numbers, and you have them on the Matisse uh, webpage uh, on the ISO website. We could uh, demonstrate the high accuracy measurement of stellar diameters, for instance, on delta V here, or measurement of high contrast binary systems on uh, Akerna, for instance, which has one uh, 100, so it's pretty, uh, pretty good. <laughs> We're pretty happy of that, demonstrating without optimizing any, anything. Okay. So uh, now uh, a new uh, comer, um, uh, I would like to present a newcomer uh, in the game of uh, Matisse, which is graph format. Because as I told you, Matisse uh, at the beginning could uh, observe on its own in what we call in standalone mode. But actually, over the last two years, uh, it, was, it, it has become possible to use the gravity fringe tucker to control even better the fringes for Matisse because Matisse doesn't have a fringe tracker, so to say. It controls the position of the fringes, but it does not have a fringe tracker. And the idea came actually very um, early that, okay, why not using the, the gravity fringe tracker to track the fringes for Matisse? That's what we call graph format, gravity for Matisse. So you have the apple of uh, gravity and <laughs> the, the M of Matisse, just made by Anthony Mion. Basically, that's very simple. You have the VLTI. Gravity is driving the VLTI. Format and Matisse is the passenger. And dra gra gravity driving the VLTI can allow Matisse to do more interesting things, increasing the sensitivity, but also allowing a full coverage of the LM band in higher spectral resolutions. Because the Huawei detector, which uh, is for the LM band, is pretty slow, I would say. And since without a fringe tracker, we uh, get uh, very short um, integration times where we have to use very short integration times to kind of freeze the atmosphere. Otherwise, you will have too much uh, disturbance of the fringes. We could not uh, actually uh, read the whole detector. That's exactly what I'm showing here. So that's a nice. Uh, fringes, um, dispersed fringes from graph format. And that's actually the spectral window you could get with Matisse in standalone due to the slowness, relative slowness of the, the Hawaii detector. That's a huge uh, progress for, for us, for sure. Okay, if you want more details on the instruments, I really advise you to read uh, the, the, that the general paper of Matisse who um, uh, got out uh, a few months ago. 
which will give you all the details you 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 want to uh, you want to have on the instrument. Okay, now let's go to the sense of Matisse and what we can do. Okay, so I won't detail that uh, slide just to remind you the, the three main driving sense cases, because you have to keep in mind that Matisse, since it observes in the thermal infrared, it's actually an infrared camera. And when you use an infrared camera, it's really to observe the mildly hot or warm uh, materials. And of course, you find those materials around young stars, around the central black hole of active galactic uh, nuclei, around uh, massive stars or evil stars, which are, uh, uh, I would say, uh, very known dust uh, factories. So all those circumstellar environments and also aging environments are the, 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 the prime targets for, for Matisse, of course. And since we have that within domain and the angular resolution uh, and the, the uh, very high angular resolution associated to that, that's, uh, let's say that's perfect. I wanted also to illustrate the attractivity of the VLT instruments compared to the other VLT instruments in terms of uh, nights uh, granted uh, per uh, semester. And you can see that the two uh, new instruments, I mean, current instruments, Matisse and Gravity, which are here, actually um, are used a significant number of nights compared to the whole number of nights that are um, actually uh, uh, opened per year uh, at the, or uh, granted per year at, uh, at the VLT overall. So it shows the attractivity of the VLT instruments and what they can, what they can do. Okay, so I will uh, then uh, I will say finish my talk, so to say, because I'm not very much finished, uh, with two aspects for the, the, the sense that can be done with Matisse. First, I would like to advertise Matisse as a thermal infrared imager at the millisecond scale. Here is, uh, I would say, an overview of the different uh, images that were uh, published so far uh, with Matisse covering different uh, topics, the, the three, actually the three topics I showed you just before, the environment of uh, evil stars here and there, YSOs, even though FS Canis Majoris is not necessarily a, a young stellar object, but okay, let's consider it's a young stellar object, and the environment of AGNs. Here you have also uh, stellar, stellar physics. So I would like just to, uh, I, I prepared, I had prepared slides to really describe uh, the, the different images, but I will, I think I will skip a few of them to really concentrate on, okay, some you probably don't, uh, didn't have uh, many details on, especially that one and the two, uh, the, the very last um, reconstructed images on the um, uh, central, uh, I would say the central part of the Cisnus galaxy. So, one of the first images that were produced with Matisse was the uh, actually the circumstellar environment around the B star F S Canis Majoris, and uh, an object that uh, Jacques knows very well. <laughs> and here we show actually the Elben image, the the mini image from 3.4 to 3.8 micron and the N-band image uh, from 8.6 to 9 microns. So that's the, the median image. And you clearly see a change of the morphology as expected, as we expected, as we had expected over many years of observations of disks with interferometry and of their um, inner sublimation rims. And um, basically the, 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 the inner regions, but just by modeling and not reconstructed images. And uh, in that object, it's clear that, okay, we have the inner distribution wing, which is nicely uh, reproduced and which agrees very well with the, the previous pioneer image. While the end bench, the end bench image shows a much more extended uh, structure, which is exactly what we expect from those disks. One part that is interesting is that the central part here is not the star, as we might have expected, but it's probably some gaseous emission around it, which may uh, actually go in the direction that 
actually that disk in, is not necessarily a accretion disk, but more a decretion disk, uh, like we, we can have around the evolved uh, B stars. So we can see that mid infrared uh, image reconstruction is a very powerful tool to probe those environments uh, at uh, the AU scale. And you see the, the primary beam here, resolution beam, which is very nice. It's a few, uh, just a few AU. I guess that you, you, you've seen uh, this result on the active galactic nuclei of uh, NGC 1068, showing, or I would say, confirming the um, expected uh, structure of uh, the, the, the type 2 AGNs, which we expected to have to be seen almost edge on with an obscuring dust torus here, plus a polar emission extension due probably to a dusty wind, which is untrained by the, by the gas. And uh, to, uh, to build on that, actually, even though there, there is uh, some debate uh, with the, the, the gravity metric construction that apparently showed, I mean, uh, went more in the direction of uh, the dust stimulation reduced to be, to be seen here instead of the top of the torus. But that's a debate that will be, uh, I think, uh, discussed even further in the next few months. Okay, the, the last one you probably never saw because it's very recent. The paper was uh, accepted a few days ago. That's the image of construction in the end band of the dusty heart of Circinus, where you clearly see actually the same uh, structure as uh, expected for a type 2 AGN, a nearly edge on disk here, so that the dust torus, a polar emission. Uh, and that's exactly what we expected from, uh, from Circinus. So these are a few uh, conclusions on that, uh, that image construction. And overall, they point toward that uh, confirmation of the unified uh, AGN model. Uh, also um, added on top of that, the fact that the, the structures that we see around those AGNs are very likely much more complex and with clumpiness, which was not uh, necessarily predicted by the, by the models. Okay, so I think I'm going to skip that. Okay, last part I would like to highlight is, uh, because that's more my part, is the use of Matisse to study the, actually the plane forming regions around young stellar objects. That's why I call that part, a sense of Matisse, a tracer of the planet building blocks because we are very much interested in observing and characterizing the, the properties, the physical properties and the composition of the dust grains, which are in the innermost regions of disks, where, expected, where we expect the, the planets to form more likely. With that diagram, which is actually illustrating the, the typical regions we are exploring with Matisse, which are very in, uh, I would say in very um, complementary to what can be done with the single dish instruments and what will be done with uh, the ELT instruments. So the aim is really to specially resolve and characterize the inner regions of uh, protomolecular disks. I think I'm gonna skip that because it was just to show you what's the, the current status of the GTO program on YSOs where we observed more than 55 uh, objects with at least one configurations of the, of the 80s. Here you have a, a histogram showing what we could observe with respect to uh, uh, previous um, samples that were observed with the MIDI instrument. Here is uh, an overview of the published results so far on YSOs, which covers the different, uh, I would say, uh, types of YSOs, you know, hair big stars, so intermediate mass Premium sequence stars, um, uh, active uh, titaries, so actively accreting titaries, FURI, which is really the, the, the prototype of that object, where basically we could get the, the, the really take home message is that we can get details, uh, details on small scale structures, on the AU scale structures, and to really understand, to provide some piece of information and some constraints. Uh, to the, the, I would say, to the understanding of plane formation, of course, the AU scale is something that makes sense. And that's why in that case, uh, Matisse is very relevant because it can trace those things. 
Whatever we can, we have an orbiting vortex, orbiting structure, which is moving on the, on the month scale around that object, or an inner accretion disk, which is very compact for FURI, which points towards the variability of the accretion mechanism, the accretion processes, or a replenishment of uh, dust cavities that we can see in many objects with nanograins here for that, uh, that uh, work on HD 17818. So that's a big, big puzzle we, we keep building. So I'm going to, uh, yeah, that, that's uh, also a, a slide to show the, what we have in preparation on other uh, objects, uh, including Titori stars, so low mass young stars. OK, so I would like to highlight the, the last part of my talk. I would like to highlight uh, actually a specific sense case that we can prove in Matisse, which is the characterization of the solid carbon reservoirs in disks. Why uh, studying the solid carbon? I mean, the carbon particles, carbon grains, because first carbon is the fourth most abundant element in the universe. Second carbon is, uh, of course, the carbon grains are super important uh, to control actually the, the opacity of uh, circumstellar uh, disks and circumstellar environments. So the irradiation conditions, the temperature, etc. And then when we hear about carbon, okay, we think about prebiotic elements and then organic components, and then life if you really go <laughs> very far. That's why it's super important to study those forms of a carbon. And in the universe, you have, we expect to find several forms for the solid uh, carbon. So I won't detail all those forms, but among those forms, there are two especially interesting forms, which actually provide signature that we'll um, explain uh, after. And in terms of plant formation, I just wanted to mention that actually in our own solar system, there is something very peculiar that we see, is that the inner uh, regions of the solar system are actually depleted in carbon. The Earth is depleted in carbon with respect to the solar composition or with respect to the uh, dust composition of the interstellar medium. And that's something very peculiar that we would like to probe. And it's possible to probe that, that question, to, to study that question on protoplanetary disks by being able to spatially resolve the innermost regions, so the 10 uh, inner 10 AU, but also to have access to features that would inform us on the presence of those uh, carbon grains. And among those uh, species that can provide features, we have those hydrogenated carbonaceous grains, which can be uh, in terms of big aggregates or in terms of big molecules that are called PHs, you know, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are those rings of C um, uh, atoms, which are hydrogenated. And that's something actually that was commonly detected around uh, young stars. About 70% of young stars were uh, has, uh, have such uh, features, infrared features for those grains, which are kind of proxy for the presence of carbon grains. So that's why they're super important to, to study in those plant forming regions. So I won't detail that, that I don't have to have time. But at, and of course, also you have the nano diamonds, which is another form of uh, carbon grains that we find in our own solar system in meteorites. But um, Unfortunately, I would say very mysteriously, nanodiamond features, which are uh, due to the CH bonds at the surface of the nanodiamonds, were detected around only three YSOs. So just around three YSOs. And we don't actually know why such nanodiamonds uh, actually do not show up in other objects. So that's another question we have about the carbon uh, nanograins in disks. Here is a, a work so I, I showed just before very quickly <clears throat> about a study of a first study on uh, the, the inner region of that helpic star, which showed actually very typical, uh, a peculiar, um, I would say, temperature behavior and um, extended emission in the innermost regions, which really pointed toward the presence of those nanograins, which maybe of carbon nature. 
And for that, we need to, uh, so carbon nanograms were favored down to one AU. And we need to rebuild on that to confirm the presence of those carbon nanograms. So I think I will pass that because I'm pretty late here. It's already 40. <laughs> so I'm going to pass that just to, to show you that there is also non good modeling of the, the, the typical target, which shows this nice nano diamond signature, HD97048. And on which you could spatially resolve for the first time and see changes in the correlated flux of this feature, showing that actually it's probably something that is um, located far from the star, at least uh, farther than uh, 10 to 15 AU from the star. And it would be a kind of sublimation radius for these uh, nano diamond uh, particles. Okay, so that's the schematic of the, the model, but I won't uh, detail it further. So overall, the characterization of solid carbon reservoirs, it's a program that we've uh, started in the frame of the, of the GTO. First in January 2021, but on 22 cents target, but uh, you may have seen that there was a mechanical issue with the element disperser wheel in Matisse, which blocked it in low resolution. Fortunately, there was an intervention in February 2022, and we could uh, get back to normal operation, to full operation of Matisse, starting from March uh, 2022. And just as um, um, overall, uh, I would say take home message for that uh, study, you have to keep in mind that we have to um, detect features, spectral features for those carbon uh, grains. But the problem is that we have the atmosphere and the atmosphere is not transparent everywhere. We have what we call transmission bands. And even the transmission bands are not super transparent. Here you have the L band and a typical transmission spectrum. And you see that the part where we expect to see those carbon features, especially around 3.3 micron, is super dirty. So there is another challenge for that study, which is to, here you have uh, actually uh, a raw spectrum of, uh, of Matisse, you can see that it's full of, uh, of structures. So the question is really how to correct for the telluric lines. And there is another ongoing work to uh, really uh, check and um, assess what we can do in interformity to correct them. Of course, the first thing is to use a reference star. So we observe the star and then a reference star to correct for the difference in transmission. But it's not perfect because you don't observe at the same time and within exactly the same conditions. But overall, it could allow to detect possibly pH uh, features in uh, Matisse total spectra, for instance, on that big star, with uh, coated spectra, which probed the enormous regions showing always actually uh, uh, a disappearance of the feature. So that's a very interesting aspect we're uh, actually st also studying, scientifically speaking, because it seems that, of course, when we go close to the star, those, uh, I would say, fragile uh, grains are kind of destroyed or actually dehydrogenated. The hydrogen atoms get uh, dispersed, and we see the, uh, the, the actually the disappearance of that feature. Here's another example, another big star. We see that the calibration shows a feature which disappears in the quality spectrum. Same for that other target. And same for that one. So we have really a, a, a behavior, a typical behavior that we are actually, I think we are really um, highlighting here. Of course, uh, uh, on the side of that um, reference star calibration, we have we, the possibility to use fitting tools. And for instance, Molekit, which is a general tool for telluric absorption correction made by ESO. And that's something we're exploring uh, further. Here you have an example of the type of correction we can get uh, for the moment. Uh, so that's the first time we use those, uh, this tool for interferometry data. Of course, it needs to uh, be refined and factored and optimized, but that's the first step, which is very encouraging. And uh, I will, uh, uh, I'll keep working on that for sure. And in terms of perspectives, of course, uh, I would say um, in terms of YSO studies in the mean infrared, 
We have the complementarity with the, the ELT instruments, the community instruments like METIS and the GWST for the intermediate and large special scales. Of course, we have the investigation of all the broadband chromatic effects and telluric lines correction in the infrared, which will also, I would say, um, bother um, the, the other instruments observing in this, within the same spectral coverage. So we'll uh, have the opportunity to build a nice collaboration, nice uh, collaboration, collaborating effort to optimize this aspect with uh, Metis uh, people. And uh, finally, I would like to uh, highlight the fact that we have also ongoing and forcing Matisse optimization at the VLTI. So I won't detail that, but just to keep in mind that uh, there is more to come. So be ready for the next ISO call for proposal for Matisse. And if you need help, of course, you have the VLTI expertise centers that uh, can help you to make proposals, prepare the observations, reduce your data, and have a first analysis of them. Okay, thank you. And sorry for being so, uh, so long. <laughs> thank you, Alexis. It was very interesting, very nice talk. Um, okay, so uh, I'll leave the floor open now for mm -hmm. some questions. So if uh, anyone has some questions, uh, please mention your name in the chat and I will uh, select you with where I give priority to the younger people first. Sure, sure, if they have questions. I feel free to ask any question. You there is no stupid question. There are only stupid answers. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone want to open? Jama has a question. Uh -huh. Yes, if I can. So thank sure. you for this talk. Uh, yeah. If you go back to your slide 20 uh, okay. on the spectrum that you have uh, after Mattis. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was wondering why this spectrum had a triangular shape. Okay, that yes, one. perfect. Yes, why do you okay. have this sort of triangular shape? Ah, that's a very, uh, I would say, academic question. That's super interesting. Thank you. Thank you for that. Actually, what you have is that the wavelength is increasing from bottom to top because you go from the L band, then you have no transmission. Here it's black because the atmosphere is not transmitting, transmitting. then you have the N-band. And uh, in interferometry, actually, the, the period of the fringes is proportional to the wavelength, which means that as you increase the wavelength, the distance between the fringe spacing is increasing. That's why you, you have a kind of triangular shape for dispersed uh, fringes, which is what you, what you expect. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? I think Denis had a nice yes, question. Please, <laughs> also very young. Uh, yeah, I have questions, but I, I yeah, can go last. No, yes, no, <laughs> uh, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Alexi, for the nice talk. Um, you did in in the science uh, overview. You didn't mention the the survey of exosodical dust. Mm -hmm. Can you uh, say a few words about that? Because I, I know there there was a first paper uh, a few years ago, two years ago. The first Matisse paper, actually. Yeah. yeah, it was the first Matisse paper. I was wondering what was the the status of the. Yeah, uh, the, the status. Matisse. Okay. Yeah. Actually, I can I can tell you we've got uh, data. I mean, uh, from the GTO side, we've got data on. Uh, four debris disks, uh, I think, yes, uh, that we are about to start really analyzing deeply with uh, Jean-Charles. Uh, so the debris disk exosodical survey cannot be, <laughs> I would say it cannot be called a survey uh, per se, but it's uh, a smaller part of the bigger YSO survey. But data were, were taken. I think good data were taken. And uh, of course, we would like to, uh, to go further in the uh, analysis of the, the L band emission to really see if we detect something, uh, some dust emission in, uh, in L band. I know that um, Florian Kirschlager uh, got, um, uh, I think he got uh, some observing time with Matisse and he, 
um, um, submit another proposal. Jean-Charles got also data on uh, another debris disk. So there is some science plan on uh, on those uh, on those guys. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And I have a second quick question, mm -hmm. which is uh, related to the carbon depletion depletion in the solar system. Yeah. Uh, what's the, the prevailing scenario for to explain this in the solar system? Ah, interesting question. Super interesting question. So, okay, here it is. Ah, sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, or is it? Okay, there. Okay. Um, actually, um, there are two uh, main um, possibilities. Uh, either uh, there is a possibility that it's, it's a paper from Lee in 2010, which uh, actually um, claimed, I would say, that carbon may be actually burning in those uh, enormous regions. Uh, due to uh, ox oxid oxidization with uh, oxygen, uh, which, if I understood well, stripped out uh, the, the, the carbon atoms from carbon grains and uh, actually made them disappear. So it's really carbon burning uh, in the enormous regions. And why there? Because, of course, in the enormous regions, the stellar radiation is strong. The radiation field is strong, and you have that thing happening uh, more, um, uh, more likely. There's also the possibility of um, favored, um, um, I would say, how do you call that? Uh, not photo evaporation, but, um, ah, sorry. Um, yeah, um, uh, wind pressure, I mean, um, um, radiation pressure. <laughs> Radiation pressure acting on uh, those nanograins because um, actually we don't know exactly. That's something I mentioned here. We don't know exactly in which form the the, the carbon grains are. Uh, it's not clear. We see features that we associated to possible um, sources because PHEs we find it on Earth. Huh? It's uh, actually it's something that you produce uh, from the industry. So it's a pollu pollu polluting uh, species. Uh, so we, we have laboratory data on those things. And when comparing those features with the features detected uh, in the interstellar medium and also uh, in disks, uh, we, we, we said, ah, probably it's, uh, it's a kind of uh, form of carbon grain. So it's not fully clear, but it seems that this nanograin structure is favored. And of course, the nanograins are uh, easily uh, blown out by the, 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 the radiation pressure, even though, even though uh, it's not so uh, straightforward because uh, you need at least some uh, I would say interaction uh, surface area, minimum interaction surface area to, to be sensitive to the radiation pressure. Uh, but it's a, it's a possibility. There is a last possibility is that uh, there is no carbon uh, formed. Uh, I mean, start, if you start, sorry, if you start from the condensation sequence uh, of solids from the initial no protostellar nebula, you need uh, uh, very carbon rich environments to condense directly from the gas phase carbon grains in the enormous regions. Otherwise, what you condense out is more metals and silicates. And you need actually C2 ratios higher than one in those environments to form, to start forming, to start condensing carbon grains. Otherwise, you do not, they, they are locked to oxygen which is more numerous, and therefore CO is volatile and you don't have formation of carbon grains. So it's a third possibility. Uh, but of course, when you form a planetary system and when you form a disk, you have injection from the interstellar medium, direct injection. So injection of crystallar grains. So the question is, what's the, the, the dominant uh, source of grains in the enormous regions? Is it the... the, the 
direct condensation out of the gas phase or the, I would say, the radial drift of the, of the grains from the outer regions. Okay, my answer was not <laughs> super short. I should have. Uh... Yeah, yeah no, thank you. I think I, I got the, the picture. Thank okay. You. Okay, good. So I see that Jack also has a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi, Alexi. Uh, Hi. Thanks for your for a nice talk. I was uh, interested by the nano diamonds that you see on the HD97. Mm -hmm. uh, can you say more on the location? And you also spoke about the sublimation radius for nano diamonds. Yes, uh, actually the the. Um, the advantage, because nano diamonds or PHEs or carbonaceous uh, grains, they were detected around young stars. There, there's no doubt about that. The thing that was not clear is down to which location they can exist. And what's, what is the, um, their uh, behavior uh, with respect to the, 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 the stellar radiation? When do they uh, dehydrogenate? when do they uh, submit and where do they submit? That's really the question. And thanks to the, the, the angular resolution of Matisse, we can actually go down to the regions where we expect such processes to happen, which are super constrainful for the, for the, um, the physics of those nanograins. And that's really the point of this study on HD 9748, because it's clear that we have a significant emission from the nano diamonds coming from that kind of inner rim, I would say. But since we are probing signatures, I mean features of the nano diamonds, you know this uh, this feature here, which is uh, due to actually CH um, excitation. So you need hydrogen at the surface of the nano diamond to for, to produce those features. So since we don't see any significant emission uh, inside, it means that very likely most of the emission from the, nan the nano diamond starts at that position. And therefore that's, I would say a kind of, uh, I would not say sublimation because you don't know exactly if the nano diamonds are destroyed, but at least we know that they are dehydrogenated for sure. Otherwise we would have a super strong emission uh, within that, that, uh, that, that thing. And knowing, I mean, given the radiation field of that star and the position at which we detect those features, it's really, as I said before, it's really super constraining for the, uh, the, the models of those, um, of those grains and how we can handle the, the dehydrogenation processes and also the destruction processes. Of, of those nanograins, because if they are uh, the main source of solid carbon grains in the enormous regions, that would be uh, a reason why we have such um, uh, depletion of uh, carbon in our own solar system, huh. because it, it may be actually not a typical feature of our own solar system, but something that is common uh, around the typical uh, 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 young, young stars. Okay, I, I see. And I, uh, can you constrain? I understand that you constrain the radial location of those uh, nano diamonds, mm -hmm. but can mm -hmm. you also constrain the uh, vertical position uh, of those diamonds? Are they in the in the surface ah. of the disk, in the mid plane, or in mm -hmm. the in the in the wind, for example? Yeah, actually, that's the second step we will uh, carry out uh, with radiative transfer. Because uh, actually, that's not a radiative transfer model. Huh? I mean, radiative transfer image. Uh, it's a temperature gradient, kind of temperature yeah. gradient um, optimized model. <laughs> do, you the, the, do you see the asymmetry? I mean, I, I see that. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, 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 we need the, the, we need the phase asymmetry. And the phases, there is the. Yeah, there is. There's I don't know if you can see here. Yeah, you see here. Okay. The closure of phase is going up and down. Yeah. Uh, and it's clear that uh, there, is a, there is an asymmetry. It's, it's not only the radiation field that is setting the position of the nanograins, uh, of the, sorry, of the nanodiamonds. Yeah, no, no. Uh, but you know that that object is so very much inclined. So that's the apparent, that's the projected separation. So it's not fully yeah. clear that. <laughs> It's it's a nice you know face on a ring. It's probably something okay. which is uh, 
um, inclined and rotated in the sense that uh, maybe that's uh, not necessarily um, a density um, a discontinuity or density change, but more an inclination effect. So that actually we see the bright side of that rim here. It's not it's not fully uh, fully clear uh, yet. And of course, since we are talking about nanograins, they are probably following the, the gas. So they're probably uh, above yeah. the, the, the mid plane. OK, thanks. OK, are there any other questions? If not, I would like to thank Alexis again. Thank you mm -hmm. very much. Uh, Thanks we to hope you. to see you at some point in Leuven, actually. Yeah? <laughs> sure, sure. I will, uh, I will, uh, I will visit uh, you guys. Uh, Denis, Jacques, I hope not, because uh, <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, yeah, I'll be able to discuss with you, uh, with you guys about uh, interferometry and uh, everything that we can do uh, with, uh, with Matisse and of course the, the, the connection with the, the upcoming uh, ELT instrument uh, Matisse. That's for sure a uh, super synergy that we can build uh, with already from what we already know uh, on, on Matisse and on the, 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 the specificity of the mean thread uh, domain. Uh, so that will be uh, ready and set for uh, Matisse. I hope. Sounds great. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. Uh, I'll Thanks you. close this seminar then and uh, see you all uh, next week. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye, bye. 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 Bye, bye. bye. bye Alexis. Bye, Romain.